Written on the pages of the great book of nature lies a truth so profound that it has beckoned men and women throughout the ages to seek its wisdom. We will continue this quest and study many stories of humanity as we search for this light. On this journey, we will examine philosophy, religion, and science to uncover the hidden mysteries behind myth and legend using the symbols of universal Freemasonry. Welcome to Legends of the Craft. Welcome back to Legends of the Craft. I'm here with Brother Axel Savari, and today's topic, today's legend, is Stoicism and Freemasonry. Stoicism is a Greek Roman philosophy that has impacted the world significantly. It's a word we use in the dictionary, actually, that we use to kind of denote somebody that's calm and collected and can go through trials and tribulations without being affected. So this philosophy has had a major impact on the Western world, and in some ways, I would say, parallels a lot of Eastern thought as well. Uh, but we'll be focusing on Greek and Roman philosophers, uh, specifically uh, Zeno of Sidium, uh, Marcus Aurelius, one of the five good emperors of the Roman Empire, uh, Seneca, and a few others. You know, in my mind, Brother Matthias, Stoicism forms another uh, link in the chain for me that connects Freemasonry to the thought of the ancient world. You know, it's often said that Freemasonry began in 1700 in the United Grand Lodge of England, and before that, there's no such thing as Freemasonry. But what we're going to look at today is Masonic thought written in Greece 2,000 years ago. In my mind, I know not everybody agrees with me, but I think that there are some parallels between the philosophy of the porch or Stoicism and Freemasonry that makes that connection undeniable. Uh, Brother Axel, I mean, there is no empirical data connecting Stoicism directly with Freemasonry, but I have to agree with you that when we look at the ideas, they're so similar that there's an overlap. Whether Freemasonry is shaped out of Stoicism or Stoicism is shaped out of something much older that connects to the ancient mysteries, I don't know if that's even as important as the teachings themselves. Is there just Stoicism is one of those philosophies that you live. A lot of philosophy is just stuff you think, and you can be a sophist and show your friends how smart you are and all that, but Stoicism is something you either practice or you disregard. It's a very active philosophy. Well, you know, the Greeks were active philosophers. Uh, Stoicism comes from the word stoa, which is Greek for porch. Um, and it was, it was given that name because Zeno of Sidium would give these lectures from the porch of the Athenian Agoras. So one of the big differences between Stoicism and Freemasonry is that Stoicism was first propagated publicly. Zeno got up and was like, I'm tired of everybody being weak and having their emotions rule over them. And he would basically stand on the porch and shout at people. And eventually people started to listen to this guy and think, hey, man, this is not just some crazy guy standing up on the porch. He actually has a, a system of thinking here. So one of the major differences is that stoicism was practiced out in the open. And it was not, like you said, some kind of like philosophical idea to be contemplated. It was a, it was a lifestyle to be lived. Just like Freemasonry. It's a lifestyle. And as we go through this podcast, I think our listeners will be amazed at how similar the ideas are between Masonic ritual and Stoic philosophy. I want to open up with a quote, which is from Plato. And this, this quote from the Republic had a lot of impact on Stoicism. Quote, There will be no end to the troubles of the states or of humanity itself till philosophers become kings in this world or till those we now call kings and rulers really and truly become philosophers, and political power and philosophy thus come into the same hands. This is a very important quote. It's basically saying that no matter how many laws we make, no matter how many systems we devise, ways to govern people, at the end, until our, our leaders are true philosophers, not, not parrots, not sophists, but true philosophers, then our states will never be run with dignity, solemnity, and efficiency. I think this is the first concept where Stoicism and Freemasonry agree with one another. Because if you look at Freemasonry, and especially Freemasonry throughout history, Freemasonry has been tied up with and um, kind of inex inextric inextricable from political events. Um, Freemasons have been present at many of the major political turning points in the last several centuries. And 
there is a tendency among Freemasons to become interested in these larger questions of life. How should we govern ourselves? How should we arrange society? What is the best way of doing this? And I think that Freemasonry and Stoicism agree that, you know, you can write as many laws as you want. You can enact as many policies as you want. But until people well and truly believe in philosophy, in unity, in brotherly love, relief, and truth, until these things are actualized in human beings, then no law can bring that into being, and no law can protect those ideas. Stoicism takes the opposite standpoint of Epicureanism, which is a philosophy that basically says, you know, live free, drink, you know, eat, be merry, for someday we'll die. And Stoicism says, no, don't do those things. That's not the best way to live your life. The way to live is to believe that you could die at any moment, and therefore your house should always be in order. You must live as if this is your final moment, and in that, you must be in control of yourself. If you indulge, then you no longer have control over your faculties, and if you don't have control over your faculties, then you're not really living a life. You're being essentially an animal, and so Stoicism is all about discipline control and self-reliance and this idea that death, death excuse me is always looming right over the horizon i completely agree with that brother matthias i think and again this is where stoicism and freemasonry agree in that you know in the face of the world as it is whereas the epicureans say you know succumb to hedonism indulge yourself take advantage while you can before you die stoicism and freemasonry say no the only way to leave a record of yourself is to live in protest to the world, to work on oneself, to subdue these animal passions, all these things that are instinctual and that feel good and bring us fleeting pleasure, that should be battled against, if for no other reason than to gain honor for oneself in that battle. So why do we subdue our passions and how do we subdue our passions? The foundation of Stoicism has eight points. And we're going to go through these eight points, and I think we should stop and kind of talk about them afterward. Uh, the first is nature. Nature is rational and can be understood by logic. Two, there is law. And the universe is governed by reason. Three, virtue. A life led according to nature is virtuous. Very important point right there. Four, wisdom. This is the root of all virtue. Five, Apathia. Passion is irrational. Life should be waged as a battle against it. Oof, I really like that one. Six. Pleasure is neither good nor bad and acceptable when it does not interfere with virtue. Seven. Evil. Things like poverty, illness, and death are not evil. That's a, that's a perception that we have. A. Duty. Virtue should be sought after and not for pleasure. So these eight points kind of are the sort of overarching ideas in Stoicism, the foundation of to, to live a Stoic life. And it's very interesting how the Stoics immediately go to this, you know, what I would say is very Masonic point of view, which is nature is the tracing board. Nature is the design by which if we kind of pierce its veil and look at its mechanics can be understood rationally and logically and can lead us to a life of virtue. If we mimic nature, then we ourselves are being virtuous. Virtue is not a set of laws created by a church or by some guru. Nature has it. Nature is really the true teacher. And this kind of empowers humanity outside the paradigm of a church or some sort of organization where you have priests or you know certain keys are given because it's saying no anybody can go into nature observe it and what do you see the laws that are rational and logical for any human mind to perceive well i think there's a very logical progression to uh you know if we can call it the eightfold path of stoicism that you've just laid out it, it proceeds in a way where each point is built on the back of, of the previous one. So we start with nature. And truly, everything starts with nature. Whether you want to call it a political system or a religious system, like all of those things sprang from observations of nature, mm -hmm. human or otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, whether or not we're going to look at how humans behave in their natural environment or 
that environment itself in the form of nature, there are logical processes that bring about certain results. Well, I got a question for you, Brother Axel. Is there any system that rejects nature? I can't think of one. There is one, and I'm not super familiar with it, but uh, Satanism. Uh, well, actually, no, that's not true. They actually say that nature's yeah, no. state is... No, that's not true. I think certain philosophies of religions maybe emphasize nature as being more important or less important, but I don't think anybody or, or any system rejects it. Actually, I, now that I think about it, I think Gnosticism and some interpretations of Gnosticism view the natural world as like uh, an illusion. And then there's the Buddhist with well, Maya and, and the idea that, that nature is actually an illusion that yeah, we're trying but I, to pierce through. I think through. that's a misconception. I don't think nature itself is some sort of, you know, like a, an illusion like the Matrix. It's just, a, it's not the real real. It's mm -hmm. still real to some degree and it has some value. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not the source of truth. So, but I think probably to the extreme view, maybe Gnosticism would, but, but even... But even to the Gnostic, nature has a value. There's things to be learned from it. I, 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 it's not a complete rejection of it. Well, I, I, I agree that it's not a complete rejection of it. I do think the difference between those systems of thought and things like Stoicism and Freemasonry is the um, the emphasis on how important nature is. Whereas the Gnostics and probably the Buddhists and the Hindus would say that the point of contemplation is to move through nature into, you know, as you put it, the real real. I think that Stoicism and Freemasonry are more pragmatic philosophies and that they they equip one to deal with the world as it is, not in some kind of abstract sense that's uh, not present. This kind of leads into the law aspect of Stoicism, this idea that the universe is governed by reason, the laws of physics. So thousands of years ago, even though they didn't have a true scientific sense, the Stoics still had this concept that there are logical rules that govern not only humans, but animals and plants and rocks and the cosmos, etc. Laws that are eternal and cannot be broken. Uh, I think we still find that true today with modern science and quantum mechanics. Even though we may not understand these laws, there are laws. And if we can learn these laws and follow them, we'll find happiness. If we fight against them, we're going to find displeasure. And this becomes a very instrumental part also in modern Freemasonry, that there is law, that we have rights as human beings. These are unalienable rights given to us by the great architect of the universe. Um, and I think this concept is very parallel in both systems. Well, and it's interesting, too, that it leads into virtue, that the observation of these laws and the living of one's life by these laws leads to virtue. That virtue is not kind of an innate concept that one has or doesn't have, but that by aligning your actions with the laws of nature, one becomes virtuous and develops wisdom, being the fourth point of the foundations of Stoicism. And that is the root of virtue. In Freemasonry, you know, wisdom is represented in the East by King Solomon, by the master of the lodge. So wisdom is one of the most central tenets in what we're aspiring as Freemasons is to obtain this wisdom, this wisdom of King Solomon, this wisdom of nature, this understanding. And from there, it becomes a route by which to explore all other virtues and to ascend Jacob's ladder and take our rightful place amongst the gods. Well, and to, and to build on that metaphor, if wisdom is the root... Strength is the trunk of the tree and its flowers and blossoms are beauty. I mean, we're, we're using wisdom to live with strength and create beauty. That is the Masonic philosophy. And I think, you know, in my opinion, that's the Stoic philosophy. It's, it's wisdom, strength leads to beauty. Then comes apatheia. Passion is irrational. So it's very interesting here. You know, in masonry, as you said earlier, you know, we are directed to subdue our passions. And Stoicism saying that these passions are irrational because they're against nature. So when we react with anger or hatred, when we allow our emotions to take control of us, that we're, we're not following the laws of the universe. We're not, um, we're not being nature. We're being something outside of nature. And so it's irrational. It doesn't quite fit in. And so that is a source of displeasure. That is the source of our unhappiness, our misery. Uh, all the calamities in our life come from this idea that we are acting out irrationally. And so if we can align ourselves closer with nature, again, we will be happy. I find it very interesting that the Stoics choose the word apatheia to describe this concept of the passions, because it's the same root for our word of apathetic. 
it's not necessarily that, um, you know, it's acting one way or another, but it's not caring about this whole concept that the Stoics find to be indulging in passion. It's not the fact that you choose one duty or another. It's not the fact that, you know, like service to the Roman state is the highest virtue. No, the Stoic idea is that service is the highest virtue. A duty is the highest virtue. Choosing something to obey, choosing some system to manifest, choosing some regulation in your life is virtue. Apathy, you know, not caring what happens, just indulging in whatever comes across your path and not really like not drawing a line in the sand for yourself. That's evil. That's passion. Apathia. And here the Stoic sees this as a war that one is waging against these these lower passions. And I think it's very correct to see it that way. I know some people don't like this imagery of war and battle and soldiers, but really, um, I think it's a necessary view. You, you have to, if you don't take it that seriously, that it's victory or death, then it becomes less important and it may not be worth fighting for. You, you, you have to view it like your life depends on it. Well, and I think that gets to the next point, this idea of the stoic view of pleasure, that it's neither good nor bad, but acceptable when it doesn't interfere with one's duty. You know, you get the impression from all this kind of war and soldier talk that the stoics are a bunch of, you know, uptight Puritans that can't um, experience any happiness or any bodily pleasure in life. And, and you know, as Greeks and Romans, I, I certainly don't think that that was the case. These men drank, they went to the theater, they, they had fun when, when it didn't interfere with duty. Mm -hmm. And that's the important part that's stressed in Stoicism and in Freemasonry, that duty should always come first. If you care about it, unless you want to indulge an apathy and you don't care. And then in that case, pleasure can overcome you and you can enter the Epicurean world of, you know, indulging oneself to, because, you know, hey, I'm only here for a little little amount of time. Well, I got a great example with this. Um, I read a biography on Mahatma Gandhi and uh, he, like all other males, enjoyed engaging in, you know, sexual intercourse. And um, his father was dying at one point. And he was at his father's side, but he really wanted to have sex with his wife. And so he went and did so. And while he was having sex with his wife, his father died. And it became a major regret in his life, to the point that he vowed celibacy till his death. And from what I read, he, he stayed with that. He, he, he never had sex with his wife ever again. I'm not saying that's necessarily the correct reaction <laughs> to it, but it is a very stoic approach saying... Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, I should have been with my father in his final moments, but my passions took over. And as a result, my, my, my father died alone. So he, he, he reacted maybe a little, little a little overreaction, strong, right? a little strong. But, but the idea is that there should be that contemplation that like, well, maybe I should have subdued my passions and waited, you know, and been at my, my father's bedside when he was dying. I know he's dying. Why did I have to leave? Well, I think that Stoicism and Freemasonry outline self-denial as a tool to improve oneself, not as some kind of like fanatical practice that has to be adhered to at all times, but as a tool to enact what it is that you want. So say like if, if what you want is to fulfill your duty or to become a better person, whatever that means for you, that your best tool, your first tool that you should cons consult is self-denial. What in your life is getting in the way of getting you from where you are now to where you want to be? Mm -hmm. And start cutting those things out. It's hard to do, and we all fail at it. But that is the tool by which you can approach these higher versions of yourself is you start denying yourself the things that are getting in your way. You take the obstacle, and you remove its presence from your life. I mean, I do this in my life. So from time to time, I quit certain things. Like, I'm not going to eat ice cream for three months. I'm not going to quit ice cream forever, but it's just, it's to remind myself that I have power over myself because I love ice cream. So I'm like, no, no ice cream for three months. Or I go through these benders where I won't eat meat or I won't indulge in alcohol and I just do it so I can prove to myself that I'm still in control because it's easy to tell yourself that you're in control. Oh yeah, I could quit this or quit that whenever mm. I want to. Can you? Can you? You should be testing yourself all the time, and that's a that's a, a test that the Stoics used on themselves, which was, you know, not 
forever quitting something, but taking these time periods to to test yourself and your resolve. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting concept too. That the idea that there is no philosophy or religion or system of thought by which like just believing in it makes you better. Like the Stokes and I think Freemasonry definitely believe that you have to try to apply these things, live them. And and try being the operative word. We're not all going to get it on the first go around. Like we have to keep applying these things. But to view your life as a laboratory and not as a kind of um, like a dressing room where you pick out the right philosophical garments and then you're the perfect person. It's this idea of coming back to oneself. Keep knocking off those knobs and excrescences from mm-hmm. your rough ashlar. Keep refining. Keep going further and further down and inward and onto yourself to see what's really there. Like these, you know, experiments in cultivating willpower. This is really big in like magic too, like Crowley and those kinds of guys was like, you know, you should deny yourself things in order to cultivate willpower as a force in your life. Evil. Stop blaming poverty, illness, death, and all these unfortunate things that happen to us as evil. They're not. This is it for for the Stoics. These are natural phenomena. You know, a hurricane, a tornado. These things come. They devastate. They destroy. They kill. But they're just they're forces of nature. You can't view them as evil. It's just part of life. You know, when you're born, there's but one fact that you will die. Everything in between is up to chance or fate. But you will die. And so it's not an evil thing. It's just a process of life. And so we're, you know, as, as people back in these, these Grecian times and these Roman times, the Stokes were trying to teach them, like, stop thinking that there's all these evil forces and, and ideas out there. They're not. They're just ideas. They're just forces. See them for what they are. Well, I think, you know, there must have been some kind of cross-pollination between the Stoics and the Buddhists. Because to me, this is very similar to the idea of Buddhism that um, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. I feel like every Stoic would have agreed with that concept that you will face pain in this life, whether it's loss, whether it's death, whether it's hardship. I mean, a lot of the Stoic philosophers served in the military. They fought in wars like they were accustomed to a hard life. But that wasn't that didn't necessarily for them lead to suffering. Just because you experience deprivation or self-denial or poverty or illness, that doesn't mean that you have to mentally indulge in it. Pain is, in some ways, its own vice, its own drug that we can indulge in, whether it's emotional pain or physical pain. It is a, it does generate a, a very specific emotional response, and it can be used as a crutch. Like, if I want to sit around and not do anything, well, then I can really feel miserable about myself, and I can mm-hmm. feel comfortable in my misery, and I can allow my misery to define me and who I am, and it gives me an identity, and it can be very comfortable, and sometimes we don't want to get out of our pain because it's who we are. But I would say that the Stoics are trying to move us past that point and say, you know, walk through the pain. You don't have to stay and suffer. You can keep going and keep going and keep going every time that you're battered down. And this leads to the duty of a Stoic, you know, or their duty is to follow nature, to find the laws that govern the universe by reason, to follow in the footsteps of those laws, to gain wisdom. To root out the irrationality of passion and to subdue it and to no longer make these judgments of good and evil based on the whims of belief and faith. This leads one to a stoic life and a great example of this are Zeno and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca who we still remember thousands of years later for their writings and for the way they live. They're examples to us and I would say that A true Freemason is no different than a Marcus Aurelius. But we'll get into him a little later because I I think we should reserve part of the podcast just to talk about Marcus Aurelius. Why don't we move on to the cosmology of a Stoic? You know, with Stoicism, we get kind of caught up with, you know, how they live their life Mm -hmm. and fighting these passions. But there was a, a very interesting cosmological system that they adhered to. And it's not unlike Eastern religion. So they believe the universe is basically a fire that came into being, a primordial fire. It's very big Mm bangish, actually, like this idea that this fire erupted and created the universe. And so there are two substances, 
passive substance and active substance. Passive substance is like uh, a piece of wood, a rock. It's basically all matter. And it's waiting for some will, the fire, some active substance to put it into motion. So the the Stoics don't really see this idea of spirit and matter like we do today. I mean, I would say it's probably the same thing, but they thought the entire universe was material. But there were two types of, of, of matter, that which had a will and that which did not have a will. And to me, I, I, I do see this very much like our mosaic pavement and launch. I see this like... Uh, this spirit, this matter, this this active, this passive. We can call it masculine, feminine. Uh, there's so many names uh, in different traditions, and it's essentially the same. It's this idea of duality. Well, I mean, it exists, you know, in modern science to an extent. You know, even though you know we don't use these more philosophical terms, but that's what we mean by matter and antimatter, the quantum world and the Newtonian world. There's there is still this um, permeation of duality in our thinking because I, I would agree that with the analysis, I think we do live in a in a dual universe, and that anyone that's trying to transcend anything has to grapple with this concept that there are dual forces that are enacting different um, different things upon us, and and balancing those and using those to generate motion is something that any successful philosophy has to encourage people to do, to, to take that tension between these two kind of warring aspects and use that as force to move oneself mm -hmm. forward. Well, for the Stoics, this active matter is intelligence. It's pure intelligence. And that's why a human being, his body is passive, but it's his mind that's active that puts the body into motion. And this kind of leads to their idea of deity. They don't, they're not so religious. It's not that they didn't believe in the gods, but to them, you know, the universe is, is one. They're, they're pantheistic. They viewed the entire universe as a living organism, so to say, made up of this primordial fire, which will burn out at some point, mm -hmm. which again coincides a little bit with bang, Big Bang Theory. Well, we have a quote here from Marcus Aurelius that addresses exactly that topic. Quote, Constantly regard the universe as one living being, having one substance and one soul, and observe how all things have reference to one perception, the perception of this one living being, and how all things act with one movement, and how all things are cooperating causes of all things that exist. Observe, too, the continuous spinning of the thread and the structure of the web. And how do we tie this into Freemasonry? Very simple. I mean, this is the celestial canopy. You know, this is the cosmos. This is the temple of humanity, the temple of the living God, which stretches from east to west, north to south, from the center to the zenith of the universe. Like, it's, it's everything. It's mm -hmm. one living being. But it's animated by this fire. It's very Zoroastrian. You know, it's very cult of Mithra. Mm -hmm. um, they're, I wouldn't say they're fire worshippers, but but the fire, the, the, the intelligence is at the core of all things. Well, I think this is an idea that's found in Freemasonry, in Buddhism, in, in many, many religions, especially the more esoterically inclined ones. That this idea of from both, one. That like it kind of acknowledges the dual nature of the universe, but points to a unity beyond that. So, so in Stoicism, you have this active and the passive, but then you have Marcus Aurelius saying constantly regard the universe as one, mm -hmm. that these dual experiences and essences are contained in a one thing. And it's the one thing that we're trying to align ourselves with mm -hmm. so that we too can be the kind of, you know, on the level with the universe in controlling these two dual forces within ourselves, we become a part of the one thing. And how do we do that? Through our five senses. So these five senses are the windows by which we as human beings can perceive the work of the primordial fire of the universe of passive and active matter. And that's why, again, you have to be so disciplined because you have to keep these windows clean. You got to keep your sight, your hearing, your touch, etc. clean. Otherwise, you're not interacting very clearly with the universe. So when you're all wrapped up in your irrational passions, your windows don't work anymore. You can't see out of them. You can't see reality. And therefore, uh, you're making up stuff in your head and this illusion that you're seeing 
I will lead you to misery. Well, I think, too, that's uh, one of the things that I like about Stoicism um, is that if there is a deficiency in your life, the Stoic is not going to look out at the universe and say it's the universe's fault. The Stoic is more likely to say there's some aspect of reality I'm not perceiving. There is some avenue of perception that I have cut off by my own indulgences than to say it's everybody else's fault. It's the world's fault. The world's bad. I'm perfect. Everything's totally fine. I just don't understand what's wrong with everybody else. The Stoic will say, no, there's some aspect of my personality that I have to change in order to better align myself with reality. They're not relativists. They're not subjectivists. There is a one true world, and we should be trying as hard as we can to align ourselves with well, it. Well, it really, it really makes me think what you just said because you know you really can divide the world into two camps, brother Axel. Um, those that would blame everyone else for all the problems in their life, or those that would essentially point the finger back at themselves. And I would say that those that more often point the finger back at themselves tend to be more successful and more happy. You know, if, at least if you can see everything as a lesson and something to grow from, then you can advance in your life. If you're constantly blaming other people, you can't grow. You're at an impasse because you can't control other people. And that leads us to a very important aspect. Out of the cosmology of Stoicism comes this idea of fate and the dichotomy of control. To the Stoic, fate is a real thing. The fates control the universe. Because think about it. If nature is rational, operates by reason and logic, then... All active matter, all all this inanimate matter is operating according to the laws of the universe. And so with enough information, you can calculate and predict exactly what's going to happen. So the entire passive material universe is controlled by cause and effect. There's nothing we can do about it. The, but fate does not extend into a few things. Into this, There, there are things that we... Our active intelligence can control, and that's where fate um, can control if we don't gain control over our passions. Otherwise, we actually can direct our own course. We can be the captain of our own ship. I, th I, I really like this concept in Stoicism that like nature does not operate with any consideration for your opinions or your preferences, that there is a... You know, and a lot of people think when they hear that, that, oh, you know, you think the universe is some cold, dead thing. It's not really that. It's like it is a living being. And the Stoics are actually one of the few philosophies to treat it with the respect of being a sovereign being. Like this idea that the one universe that is alive is actually like not our servant. It's not our slave. Like we coexist with it. We don't control it. It's not up to us to decide how the world works. It's up to us how we behave in the world that is working. So the Stoic philosopher Epictetus had um, two sets of things that he believed were not in human beings control and a set of things that were in our control. And by properly analyzing and living according to these principles, he believed that we could actually approach true happiness. So Epictetus believed that the following things were not in our control. Our physical body, material objects, our reputation, our command over others, and essentially everything outside the reach of one's own mind. On the other hand, he believed that these things were in the control of human beings. Personal opinions, our laudable pursuits, our passions, aversions, and essentially every decision based on our own reasoning. Well, I mean, this is pretty common sense. I can't argue this. I mean, there's, there's nothing I've ever learned in my life that would tell me that I have control over my physical body. You know, as I get older, I'm, I'm constantly cursing it because it doesn't do what it used to do. <laughs> and I, I think a, a stoic would be like, well, you, you can feed your body good food, you can give it exercise, but ultimately... You can't prevent yourself from getting a disease. You can't prevent yourself um, from getting your arm chopped off. Like There are things that will happen to your body that are outside your control. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't treat your body as best as you can, but ultimately it is not active. It is passive matter, so it's out of your control. Well, it also doesn't belong to you. You know, it, it's it's kind of funny to say... <laughs> well, you're going to really piss some people off of that. <laughs> well, it, do, it doesn't. It, it's not your creation. You didn't make it. 
It's something that you were given in order to explore the universe in. But, I mean, it's funny to say that, you know, the Greeks didn't believe that the they had any control of their physical body when they were a culture that was so obsessed with physical activity and physical perfection. But I think the philosophical point that's being made is that, you know, we, what we are, the, the self, the, the perceiving kind of essence of a human being, is not the body. The body is a vehicle. The body is kind of a, an interdimensional spacesuit that we're allowed to kind of explore. <laughs> I know you're laughing at me, but I, I'm going to stick with it. It's an interdimensional spacesuit. It's, it's something that the will, the fire, uses in order to move around in physical substance, in passive and active matter, and experiment in, in how to use that. But essentially, it's not yours, and it will decay, and it will die eventually. These, these were people that were very accustomed to physical death. Like the Greeks knew death. Many of these sol- many of these philosophers were soldiers. And in your daily life, life was a lot harder. And you were accustomed with people dying. So the physical body went away. It wasn't something that anybody thought was permanent by any sense of the imagination. But there, the things that are permanent is the essence that uses the body. And it, that's why I think that they would say that the body is not in our control because it's not our possession. Well, it's kind of like reputation. You know, people very much care about their reputation, what people think about them. But ultimately, I cannot control what you think about me. No matter how many gifts I give you, how nice I am to you, or, or even mean to you, you know, I cannot dictate to you how you feel. I cannot change your mind. I am not in control of what other people think about me. And I think... If the world woke woke up to this reality, um, there would be less pomp and there'd be less vanity and there'd be less, you know, trying to get everybody to like you. I think this is one of our obsessions today, especially with social media, is everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be loved. But ultimately, that you can't do that. And if you try to do it, you can never be virtuous because being virtuous is following the law. But every time that you're kind of like playing to people and trying to get them to like you, you can never do the right thing because you're only you're doing what they want, not what nature wants, but what they want. Therefore, it's kind of following like a false god. Well, I, th- I think the, the point um, that the Stoics would make is like, well, maybe you could be following natural law and trying to appease others, but you might not be. It's not constant. The law of nature is constant. The feelings of other people are not constant. They're notoriously fickle and they change all the time. Nature doesn't change. Like, yeah, the seasons pass, the stars rotate, like the way things look changes. But the laws of nature, the way that those things manifest, they don't change. So in accordance, so if you live in accordance with that, you live in accordance with something that is consistent. If all you live in accordance with is popular opinion, well, that's going to change all the time. That's not a secure footing. And that's not a way to build a solid stoic life. In Freemasonry, the motto, do your duty no matter the consequences, is a result of the stoic approach to your reputation. You need to do what you need to do because it's right, whether you receive ridicule or praise. And if you don't believe in that, then you're just at the whims of everyone else. You're really just a puppet, and therefore you are no longer in control of yourself, and you're following fate. While you, while you chase reputation, fate is controlling you. Because it's there is no end to it other than being wrapped up into a cause and effect made up by other active minds. Well, I think you know two more distractions on this list: material objects and our command over others. I think material objects are here for the same reason that the physical body is outside of our control. Material objects are made of matter; they will fade. They're not constant. They they're, live and die. They're tools. They're things to be used for a certain amount of time, but eventually that too will fade. As will our command over other people, like. Again, trying to control everything is something that the Stoics say is a waste of time. You can only control yourself. Stop trying to control other selves and try to command yourself. Well, I mean, you can see this in the workplace. So, you know, you get this new guy that comes in and says, oh, I'm in charge. I'm the boss now. I, you know, I, I got this title. I'm, I'm manager, you know, whatever. And they think that by that title alone that people have to listen to them and respect them. It doesn't happen. You know, people respect their bosses if that boss is following the natural law, in my opinion. They're doing what's right, and they are following the tenets of the company and the project and taking care of everybody. But a title alone does not 
gain you any sort of, you know, fan base, I guess is the right word mm-hmm. for it. You know, like you can't just show up and be like, I'm in charge. You have to listen to me. People just walk away. People follow another person because they see something in that person that they want to gain, that they, they, they admire. And if you don't live a virtuous life, then no one's going to look at you and be like, oh, I want to be like that guy. Well, it's the same thing we were talking about with, you know, politics and government earlier. Like, you're not going to legislate people into being the best versions of themselves. Just the same way you can't command people to be better or to respect the title. You can only do those things by living by example. And that is essentially like the, I think, the the real message of both Stoicism and Freemasonry is that your life should be an example for other lives. You must be an exemplar. That's all you can do. That's the only way you can change the world is to show people the light. You can't force people to the light. You got to show them the light. And I think there's two quotes here that I kind of want to share here. Well, I'll do the first and you can do the second, Brother Axel. So Seneca said, quote, fate leads the willing and drags along the reluctant. That's a great quote. Mm-hmm. And it's so true. It's like fate doesn't really give a damn about you. Mm-hmm. You know, you can either follow it's, it's it. It's going or, to or, operate no yeah, matter what. Exactly. Choose choose to get going or, or get left behind. And the other Seneca quote we have here is, here's your great soul, the man who has given himself over to fate. On the other hand, that man is a weakling and a degenerate who struggles and maligns the order of the universe and would rather reform the gods than reform himself. I mean, how timely is that idea? This idea that he who would rather reform the gods than reform himself is, is dragging the order of the universe completely out of whack. And not to, the, not to the detriment of the universe, to the detriment of his own self. I really like this idea that, you know, you're not going to do damage to fate. Fate's going to do damage to you if you're not willing to go with the flow, essentially. And this brings up one of Stoicism's greatest uh, calls and mottos, which is amor fati, which is Latin for love of fate. You must become a lover of fate. Just you got to follow the course of nature, and you see this with the Stoics. You know they're living through plagues and wars, and it's not that they don't pick up arms. They're not necessarily pacifists. They're not this or that. It's just they do what they have to do because of the circumstances they're in, and that's it. You know it's very Bhagavad Gita. It's very Arjuna and Krishna. Like Mm -hmm. just do what you need to do. It's like. You know, stop being worried about all the consequences. You're in a position either as a politician or a soldier or as a father or mother. You know, you may be a a merchant. You may be a slave. Just do your duty no matter what because in the end, we're all going to die. Well, I really like that idea that each of us has, everybody can access duty no matter what. Whether it's, you know, what you think it is or not, there is some purpose for you in the universe. You know, nature does not evolve purposeless things. Each one of us is here to do something. And the stoic idea is like, just pick what that is. Like, do what you're here to do. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do somebody else's duty because you think it's better than your own. Do what you're here to do. Mm -hmm. And don't complain. Right? Like, do that virtuously. Whether or not it's what you wanted or what makes you feel good or what gets you the most acclaim from other people, just do your duty. In masonry, we do ritual, right? And so we're doing the same rituals. We're making the same preambulations. We're saying the same words. We're making the same acts. And one of the biggest complaints that I've seen in Freemasonry by those brothers that may not quite understand the significance of the rituals. Well, why does it always have to be the same? Why is it so repetitious? Well, it's kind of silly because the word ritual implies sameness and repetition Mm -hmm. and routine and habit. But I think the ritual, uh, if we were to tie it to a morfati, to the love of fate, it is teaching us fate. We Mm -hmm. do the same thing over and over because it's teaching us the lessons of nature. Each Masonic ritual is a moral theme. It's a moral lesson. So you repeat it because it's trying to show you these lessons of nature. It's trying to show you the laws of the universe. It's trying to make you virtuous. So how do you do that? We do these rituals where we enact virtuous acts and say virtuous things over and over and over until maybe one day, if we're so lucky, it might get through to our heads and we may actually act that way in public. 
You know, this reminds me of, uh, of something from our personal lives, that uh, an exercise that you kind of clued me into one time. Uh, Brother Matthias and I worked together, and uh, one time I asked him, hey, can we listen to some different music? We've been listening to the same song on repeat <laughs> all day. And you're like, you know what? No, we're going to listen to this song until you find the beauty in listening to the same thing over and over and over again. And it really was like a lesson in considering Masonic ritual. If you can't you know, find the infinite in one finite piece of the universe, then are you really awake to what's going on around you? Especially a Masonic ritual. Yeah, we go through the same rituals over and over and over and over again. But are you bored with the laws of nature? Because that's what's encapsulated in a Masonic ritual. That's what's encapsulated in a piece of music. You know, a piece of music operates by the laws of nature. Are you bored of the laws of nature? Are you bored of, of existence and its mysteries? Or is it that you think that you require all these myriad different forms? Well, I think when you are constantly looking for something new because the old bores you and you don't want that repetition, that's giving into your passions. That's like that's literally the core mm-hmm. of your passions. A passion is seeking a new thrill, a new height, an undiscovered country, so to say. And so I think it's very important that we learn to love that which is the same. Sameness, repetition. We can be there. Sometimes it's going to be new. I mean, that's the whole point of life. Like, you, you're not in control. Fate mm. is controlling the, these, these meat sacks that, that we're in. And things are going to happen. So enjoy your life while it is sameness. And enjoy your life while there are new adventures. I mean, look if we look at COVID. COVID is, is, is so interesting to me because I've never had to um, be quarantined for so long, for months and months at end. And at first I was like, man, this is a nice reprieve from having to travel all the time and I have to, you know, go visit all these people and go to these parties and this meeting and that meeting and this study. And now I cannot wait to get back to what's (laughs) normal because I don't like it anymore. But I enjoyed it at first. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I need to learn to flow with it. Like there's just times that I might have to be stuck in my house for four months. And there'll be times where I'm just traveling every weekend for four months. Both are good. Both are needed. Just follow nature. Well, I think, you know, there's a reason that this philosophy emerged 2,000 years ago when uh, people were much more in tune, in my mind, with this kind of rhythm of crisis that happens on Earth. You know, we, we've built up this incredibly complex society that allows us not to really feel the pain of life the way that the Greeks did. Like, we don't really have to provide for ourselves in a very physical manner. We don't have to take care of things for ourselves. We don't make make things for ourselves. Other people do that for us. And, and I'm not saying civilization is bad by any means, but when a, when a crisis like this comes along, we're like, wait, no, life was supposed to be so comfortable. And now I have to adapt to something different. But that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted to do. Well, fate doesn't care what you wanted to do. No. Fate's going to deal you a hand. Sometimes a virus comes out of nowhere. Sometimes an earthquake will level level your city. Sometimes there's a hurricane. That's just what there is. That's and sometimes nature. you win the lottery. Mm-hmm. Again, let's look at Seneca's word. Fate leads the willing and drags along the reluctant. It's just so true. Everybody's moving. It's you're, just, you're it's, moving. How do you feel about well, it? You don't have a choice. You're, mm-hmm. you're going to move through space and time whether you like it or not. So let's look at particular ethical ideas behind Stoicism. Um, they actually follow the four cardinal virtues that we find in masonry. Uh, wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. So it's very interesting that this pivotal ethical uh, core of masonry is also right at the center of stoicism exactly the same words mm-hmm. it's these four cardinal, cardinal virtues and those four together make a square and that square is what makes a perfect person yeah there's a reason that these virtues are outlined in the masonic lodge just as they were in greek classical philosophy because they're true you know when something survives <laughs> when something survives two thousand yeah. years there's a reason for it that's not just you know um philosophical inertia or people liking a certain idea it's because they stand the test of time with wisdom courage justice and temperance any crisis any any challenge to comfort any upset to the balance of life can be confronted and dealt with using those four cardinal virtues so let's begin with wisdom wisdom to the stoic is the ability to think and act using experience understanding common sense and insight but all concurrently Courage is that choice, that that willingness to act rightly 
in the face of adversity. And uh, justice, uh, I would say justice is, is harmony to the Stoics. You know, it's harmony between people, it's harmony between cities, it's harmony between nations. It's the harmony that we find in nature. And finally is temperance. And, and I love temperance because it, it, it goes to this idea of you have to do it. It's this voluntary self-restraint or moderation, a self-imposed regulation in every aspect of of life. Well, and that's why Freemasonry can only be entered by those who are willing to come to it of their own free will and accord. Freemasonry is a system of rules, of regulations. There are things you can't do as a Freemason. You know, I, I think a lot of the time people hear the word Freemason. They're like, oh, well, you do whatever you want. <laughs> Not that kind of freedom, bro. Like, Freemasonry is about limiting oneself, about conforming to a higher ideal. There are limits to it. You can't do certain things and still call yourself a Freemason. Well, and this is where we get the square and the compasses. Um, yes, they're used to design buildings and to build pyramids and all sorts of glorious structures throughout the world. But in a very simple philosophical way, the square is the four cardinal virtues. It's it's wisdom, prudence, justice, and uh, what's the other temperance. one? Temperance. And temperance. And the compasses, you know, delineates a circle, but you can widen uh, or narrow the points of the compasses. Mm-hmm. And this, this is this ring past knot. This is the boundaries of our actions, mm-hmm. right? So the square and the compasses is really a square and a circle. And... Those two work together to regulate our actions in everyday life. Like really the square and the compasses is symbols of of ethics and morality. It's a foundation and a boundary. I I think those two words that you just used are are, are kind of the perfect essence of those ideas is that we all need a foundation in our lives. We need something to stand on, something that we believe to be true. And in believing something to be true, we set a boundary for ourselves. It's inevitable. When you believe that something is true, that excludes other things. It makes a boundary. It, and like you said, we can widen it. We can narrow it depending on what the circumstances require. But we all require a boundary. We all should endeavor to find our boundary and to enact everything within that boundary. But we cannot. I can't be you. You can't be me. I can't live other people's lives. So there are natural boundaries to what I'm able to do and what I should think that I'm able to do. I have to do my duty. I can't do mine and yours and somebody else's. That's just not possible. Nor is it efficient, nor is it desirable. There's always limits. You can't get away from it. The whole universe, all matter is literally beginning and endings. You know, there's the beginning and ending point of every surface, uh, of every plant, of every mineral. That, and that's how we distinguish things is by their beginning and endings, is by the alpha and the omega that is present in, in all of matter, of this passive matter, right? Mm-hmm. But we have to find our place within there and how we interact and how we do that by following nature. And, and, and Marcus Aurelius had a really good analogy of this, which is um, the truth is like a river that is coming down the mountain trying to get to the ocean and our passions are all those obstacles along the way you know a dam uh a a tree that's fallen you know some rock formations whatever and but the water is still trying to find a way around so what we can do as stoics as freemasons i'm going to use those interchangeably is get rid of the obstacles and what we do is when we are temperate when we find moderation then the path of the water gets a little straighter. When we have courage, um, when there's adversity, it gets even you know more straight. You know when we are wise in our decisions and we don't give in to our passions, even straighter. And when we act in accordance to justice, when we create harmony between friends and people and situations, then it's so straight that it's going straight to the ocean. That's the quickest way. You know, out of this this rat maze, mm-hmm. essentially. Like the uh, the great sage and philosopher Bruce Lee once said, "Be like water, right? Don't try to smash yourself against these obstacles. They'll, they're they're obstacles for a reason. They'll beat you. Be like water. Find a way to flow around it. Flow through it. Flow above it. Th- flow under it. However, you have to get to the ocean. Get to the ocean. Don't worry about." The tree in your way, the dam in your way, the boulder that's fallen into the river. Flow around them. Mm -hmm. Find a way. And and frankly, even if your passions get in the way, like let's say some sort of rock that's trying to stop the water, the water will 
cut right through the rock eventually. It might take a long time, but eventually the water will break through. Our true essence, the primordial fire that's burning within us from the beginning of time, according to the Stokes, it will finally find its way back to its source. So we're just getting in our own way, and we just need to get out of our own way, so to say. So, Brother Axel, let's let's try to get close to the end of this uh, the study group here that we're doing because it's uh, we could talk hours about Stoicism, and this is my favorite part of of what we've designed here for this podcast, which is the spiritual practices of the Stoic. And there's there's ten points here um, of actual practical things that anybody can do to practice Stoicism um, and to become a better person. So, you want to start with the first one? The first point is to practice misfortune. And here's what uh, Stoic philosopher Seneca had to say about this idea. Quote, It is in times of security that the spirit should be preparing itself for difficult times. While fortune is bestowing favors on it, it is the time for it to be strengthened against her rebuffs. I really love this idea. This, this you know, idea of always turning conventional wisdom on its head. When, you know, when fortune smiles upon us, our natural instinct is to take those blessings and bask in them. Oh, I'm so great. Look at all these wonderful things that are happening for me. The Stoic says, don't trust it. It's going to turn on a dime because that's the way nature works. So while all these good things are happening to you, while you have bountiful resources, while everything is going your way, make sure that you are prepared for the opposite because it comes. And there are days and nights in life. There are days and nights in progress. There are ups and downs, peaks and valleys. The same concept is found in Freemasonry. You know, this idea of always be planning for the worst. To me, this is the chamber of reflection. This place, you know, you, you should reflect every day and every night where, you know, what has happened and to prepare yourself for what's going to happen. And what do you do? You do simple things, you know, you put a little kit in the back of your car in case, you know, you blow a tire and in the middle of nowhere, you have an extra, you know, a tank of gas. This is where you save some money for a rainy day. This is where, you you know, you sit and you contemplate and you're like, man, I got all this good stuff. What do I do with it? Let me pay some debt off. Let me, let me, you know, maybe put some away so I can build a house or get a mortgage. Like this is advanced planning. And I think it's very, very important. The second point of Enchiridion, of turning the obstacle upside down. And we have a quote here from Marcus Aurelius about this. Quote, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. I really like that phrase. What stands in the way becomes the way. We are to use our obstacles to propel us forward. That's what, like, that boulder in the river could become a stepping stone if only you look at it in the right way. Every obstacle presents an opportunity for us. And, and ultimately, like, even though the Stoics, you know, deny themselves these temporary pleasures, it is ultimately an optimistic philosophy. Because no matter what you throw at a Stoic, they're going to use that for their own advancement. Whether it hurts them in the short term, it's going to benefit them in the long term. This is where I bring in Star Trek. This is the Borg, <laughs> right? They, they, they analyze their enemies' defenses and offensive weapons and shields. And eventually, they take it, they adapt to it, and they make it part of theirs. So to me, turning the obstacle upside down is assimilating all your obstacles into yourself. and It becomes a part of you. So, for example, if we have a, you know somebody that doesn't like you, you know, usually we just respond by being like, I don't like that person. What you should really do is take the time to try to find a way to befriend them. And I had this example when I remember uh, there was somebody in my wife's family that didn't like me very much. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to turn this person into my friend. So I kept inviting them to stuff. I showed up to their events and all this. And eventually they looked at me and they're like, how did you weasel your way? I hated you so much, you know, because my, my wife's family is very religious and they saw me as a, as a non-religious person. And I just kept working it until this person became my friend. So I turned that obstacle upside down. And now I'm very close to this person and we're, we're almost best friends. But it's like if I had viewed that person as an obstacle, as an enemy forever, I wouldn't have that friend. Mm -hmm. So you, we have to look at obstacles as something that we have to assimilate into ourselves and acknowledge that there is a problem. It's not just me. I can't just point the finger all the time. Well, this is encapsulated in masonry and the idea of the rough ashlar. 
that within difficult things, there are always worthwhile things. And that by expending labor upon difficulties, we turn them into benefits for ourselves. If we never worked on ourselves, and that's difficult work to do, like we wouldn't become better people. We wouldn't uh, release the things within us that not only ourselves, but the whole world will benefit from. But in order to do that, there's difficulties in the way. There's going to be obstacles. But within every obstacle is... You know, I don't want to say reward because that kind of cheapens it, but there is something worthwhile in every difficulty. There's hidden and treasure. There's hidden treasures, There's hidden exactly. Treasure. All right, let's go to number three. Number three, remember how small you are. Quote, Alexander the Great and his mule driver both died, and the same thing happened to both of them. I, that's that's such a great idea of like you know humbling oneself, of living on the level. It's, it's, it's mm-hmm. in masonry. Remember who you are and how... You know, how much the universe is going to move on when you're gone. We're not waiting for you. Existence doesn't wait on you. You can either get with the program or be forgotten. So the fourth one is sympathia. Take the view from above. And here's a quote from Marcus Aurelius. Quote, how beautifully Plato put it. Whenever you want to talk about people, it's best to take a bird's eye view and see everything all at once. Of gatherings, armies, farms, weddings and divorces, births and deaths, noisy courtrooms or silent spaces, every form, people, holidays, memorials, markets, all blended together and arranged in a pairing of opposites. End quote. Like you said earlier, I think this is the idea of the mosaic pavement in Freemasonry, that we all look down upon this blending of opposites. And it's so easy, like in our daily lives, to, you know, see only the trees and not the forest. But masonry every time we enter the lodge we see that mosaic pavement and we're reminded to look from above look down upon it and see the whole for what it really is and not get lost in the opposites you know reflecting off of one another well, if you're on a plane right now looking over new york city over chicago los angeles they look like perfect places where all the movements of vehicles and lights are were meant to be that way it's only when you get into the details into the nitty-gritty that you're like oh man look at all these problems look at this misery but from above when you see everything it's more holistic and i think that gives you a better perspective and when you're not in that in the details, you don't get caught up in them. Your passions don't get confused and think that this one detail is the reality of everything. It's easier to see the life in the whole when you take that perspective. You know, when we're down here on the surface of the earth and we're wrapped up in our own lives, you know, it's very easy to think that, well, I'm really the only living per Me and my friends, we're the only ones that are really yeah. alive. All those other people, like, they're basically stories in a newspaper. The details become echo chambers. Exactly. And from the bird's eye view, there are no echo chambers. It's, yeah. you, you, you're, you're, you're taking in all these different perspectives and all the systems working concurrently with one another. You know, I, f- I forget which of the uh, Apollo astronauts said this. I, I think it was uh, Neil Armstrong, but he describes seeing the Earth from space. And, and about his experience, you know, with that vision and of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, of, of it being a transcendent moment, of realizing how truly united we all are and that, that we are all in the same situation, that we all form these infinitesimal portions of this really beautiful greater whole and what a powerful experience that was. And it made me think, like, I wonder, you know, it's probably not too far off in the terms of human history, but I wonder how the world will change when that experience is more open to more people. So our fifth point is memento mori, meditate on your mortality. This is huge to the Stoics. And here we got a quote from Seneca, quote, let us prepare our minds as if we'd come to the very end of life. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's books every day. The one who puts the finishing touches on their life each day is never short of time. End quote. This is such an important idea. Memento more. It's a motto you actually find in masonry. And it's a motto. Uh, there's a very cool little story that I guess Roman generals, when they had won great battles and they were returning to Rome, uh, one of their servants uh, would, would walk behind them constantly repeating, Memento mori, Memento mori, Memento mori, Memento mori. Remember that you are mortal and that you will die. To keep down the vanity and the pride of this general. Mm-hmm. And it's a very interesting custom that I almost wish we used today uh, in many of the aspects of our political life. Like, just remember, you're mortal. Like, yeah, you think you're on top of the world today, but tomorrow you're going to be under 
the ground in a grave. This makes me think of the philosophers among the samurai and the Bushido culture, this idea that every day you should contemplate your death in a thousand ways so that when you inevitably face it, you can continue doing your duty until your last breath because you've in your mind so clearly lived through every possibility of your own death that whatever whatever way it actually comes to you, you've already lived it. You can laugh and you say, yeah, I've been here before. You're not going to get me. Like I'm going to keep fighting until you take it away from me. I will not die before I'm dead. I think that's that's kind of the, uh, you know, it's it's often said about the mysteries that if you die before you die, then you don't really die when you die. Does that make sense? Like mm-hmm. if you if you confront your death while living, then actual death is not going to be such a confrontation for you. Well, and this this is obviously to any Mason, they'll see how Masonic this is. I mean, ma- Masonry is essentially instructing us how to die. Masonry is teaching us how to live a life worthy of remembrance. It's teaching us to live every day and to be ready to die in the name of our principles at any given moment. And it's not throwing your life away. It's giving your life to fate. So our sixth point is to ask yourself, is this within my control? Quote, this is from Epictetus. The chief task in life is simply this, To identify and separate matters so that I can say clearly to myself which are externals not under my control and which have to do with the choices I actually control. Where then do I look for good and evil, not to uncontrollable externals, but within myself, to the choices that are my own? We would all be a lot less angry and frustrated with life (laughs) if we practice this. Just ask, like, can I control this? No. Okay. Then then either walk away or accept it, but you don't need to sit there angry for three weeks because Mm. somebody broke up with you. Like, you're not in control of this, you know? And then we just sit in there sad because the person we love broke up with us. And I'm not saying there's not going to be some sadness, but you you can't control it. You, You have to learn from it and move on. You can't be miserable. You know, we, we, we lose loved ones and then it's like we can't continue our lives. And no, we have to continue our lives. You must. Not that there shouldn't be some mourning and not that you have no remembrance of that person, but you can't be paralyzed by those things that you do not control. Well, even beyond that, and you know, maybe I'm the only crazy person in the world that does this, but I, I, I bet some of our listeners can sympathize. I, I find myself sometimes like in my own head experiencing realities that have no possibility of ever existing like (laughs) like having arguments with people that a are not a part of my life anymore and b probably wouldn't argue this way with me if they were actually in front of me and i and i catch myself in these moments of like i've just created this entire separate existence completely beyond my control that wouldn't exist even if it could in the regular world and that's what i'm spending my mental energy on right now that's because humans they all think they're in movies and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and and all these fantastic things are happening. Oh, this person's thinking about me this way. They probably haven't even thought about you for one moment, but you, <laughs> you're so obsessed with yourself that you think everyone's thinking about you, talking about you, putting you down, talking behind your back. Not that that doesn't exist, but it's probably a lot less than we think. We're not that important in the scheme of things. So let's go to number seven, uh, philosophical journal. Quote, I examine my entire day and go back over what I've done and said, hiding nothing from myself, passing nothing by. The sleep which follows this self-examination is particularly sweet. That's the most like excited Seneca ever got, I think. That one sentence right there. <laughs> it is a great quote because, I mean, this this back to the chamber of reflection. This is the this is the the will, the the philosophical mm. testament. You're not supposed to do that once when you become a mason. You're supposed to do that every day. It's it's a journal. Mm-hmm. Some people use dream journals to do this. Some people actually write about their day's events. Um, it's a practice a lot of young kids were taught, like in churches and all that. Mm-hmm. I see it as something that's kind of dying off. But really, when you can reflect on your day and you can write it down, put it to pen, then you can really examine it. You can be objective. Thinking about things sometimes leads you down kind of weird roads. But when you write it down, it makes it real. It makes it logical. It's organized. And therefore, you can dissect it better. Well, sometimes when you're thinking them, you don't realize how stupid your own thoughts are until <laughs> until you can actually write them down and look back at it and be like, wow, man, that really has nothing to do with reality. Like, that's not what was going on in that situation. It makes you an objective observer in your own life. Our eighth point here 
premeditatio malora. And I hope I got that pronunciation right. Practice negative visualization. Ooh, I love <laughs> negative visualization. And we have another quote from Seneca here. Quote, nothing happens to the wise man against his expectation, nor do all things turn out for him as he wished, but as he reckoned. And above all, he reckoned that something could block his plans. This is Murphy's Law. Plan for the worst. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And if you live your life planning for those things that will go wrong, then when they don't, you can be pleasantly surprised. And when you do, when they do, you can be prepared. We shouldn't mistake in this with, with pessimism. This is not pessimism. You can be extremely idealistic and still practice negative visualization. I guarantee, like, um, all the great scientists, you know, uh, uh, and Einstein... Um, a great military leaders like Patton or Napoleon, they're all practicing negative visualization. They're, they're thinking all the wrong things that could happen mm-hmm. to them, how their experiments will go wrong, how their battle plans will go wrong. If you think of a good businessman, they're constantly thinking, you know, are we, gonna, are we going towards an economic downturn? Can I get these resources? Are my employees going to be happy with these decisions? Are my customer going to like these products? Ultimately, if you don't think that way, you're pretty poor at whatever you do. The U.S. Army has a great motto when it comes to this. Like, pl- failing to plan is planning to fail. Like, mm-hmm. w- without yeah. negative vi- – and that's really, like, the encapsulation of negative visualization. Plan for the worse and expect that you are to be prepared for the absolute worst thing to happen at every turn. And that way, if you avoid even some catastrophe, you're already ahead of where you had planned to be. And in masonry, this is degree work. Like when you're preparing to be an officer, you need to be prepared for your candidate, the neophyte, doing things that you don't expect. You have to be prepared. And I think that's why the director of ceremony is such an important position. The director of ceremony's job is to make sure the ceremonies flow by being there when there's a problem before the problem even happens. Mm-hmm. And that's because the director of ceremony, the DC, uh, in some lodges they're called the marshal or the master of ceremonies. It's the same thing. Um, they practice negative visualization. You're looking at everybody in your lodge like, that person's going to screw up. That person's going to do this. You don't say it. You're mm-hmm. just there ready with the ritual book. You're there to fix the problem. You're in the shadows. And you just make sure the ceremonies are continuing with solemnity and dignity. Mm-hmm. But you are prepared for the worst. And if you don't do that, then you're a terrible director of ceremonies. And a director of ceremonies is critical to any ceremony. Well, and following on that, our ninth, our ninth point, as we talked about earlier, Amor Fati, love everything that happens. No matter how well you plan, no matter how negative your visualization is, no matter how detailed your philosophical journey, no matter how much you can anticipate the future, something is going to happen that's outside of your control. Mm-hmm. And it's at that point where we can indulge ourselves in misery and suffering. Oh, things didn't go the way I wanted to. This is what I want. Uh. Or... You can sit back, you laugh, and you say, well, I guess that's what's going to happen. And I will deal with life yeah, as it presents but, itself. But you know what's funny is that when you talk to people, you know, nostalgically about stories, it's always about the bad things that happened to them and how they <laughs> endured and overcame. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the stories you hear from people all over the world. It's like, oh, man, check this out. This happened to me, but this is, you know, I, I got out of it this way. Like, you know, we don't like misery in the moment, but we always look back on misery as some sort of nostalgia. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying, you know, in, in cases of extreme violence or abuse and stuff like that, but but there's this idea that adversity, you know, can bring happiness to us. Like, we, we like overcoming, and when we overcome, it's a point of pride. Well, and, uh, you know, to your point, I remember I was talking recently to somebody I used to work with in the service industry. We used to work at a bar together. And it's interesting that, you know, thinking about that conversation, like how much of it was like, oh, you remember this really hard night we had? Or you remember this, you know, incredibly annoying customer that we had? Like you bond over over shared suffering. That's just an instinct. what soldiers do. It's an instinctual aspect of human life. And that like this idea of, you know, overcoming things in life, bringing people closer together. And that leads us to the 10th point, which is to promote the welfare of others. Quote, men exist for each other, then either improve them or put up with them. Marcus Aurelius. (laughs) That is definitely the quote of a Roman Empire, of a Roman Emperor. (laughs) Either improve these people or just put up with them. Well, but we have to be careful because this isn't like go around and change people. You can't change. You don't have control over people. It's like 
but you can't help people. This is fraternity. This is brotherhood. This is relief and truth right, right here. You know, we can help each other. You know, like if you have a burden, I can come to your aid. I'm not changing you, but I'm helping you, mm-hmm. you know, and you can do the same for me. So I think this final idea of the Stokes, which is be a servant to your fellow man, be your brother's keeper. You know, I, you know, at the end of the day, the highest ideal is to serve. So as we come to the end of this podcast, Brother Matthias, and at, you know, on the t- on the tail of that great quote that you just read, let's talk a little bit about Marcus Aurelius. And mm-hmm. I, I know he's your favorite Stoic. He's one of my favorite philosophers of all time. Let's talk a little bit about Marcus Aurelius and what he was able to do with Stoicism. Well, I mean, he was one of the five good emperors of Rome. You know, there was this, this period of the Pax Romana where there was essentially 200 years of relative peace. People could travel on the roads without getting robbed. Um, not that there wasn't warfare and, and catastrophe, but, you know, it, this was a good period. The, the historians view this very well in history. There was the empire was being built and expanded. Um, and Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic and he was an emperor. And what's very interesting is that, you know, being basically the emperor of the greatest empire political body on earth at that time, he could he could do whatever he wanted. He could execute people. He could sleep with who he wanted. He could eat as much as he as he desired, but he lived a very stoic life. He lived, uh, obviously he lived in a palace because he was the emperor, but he lived, you know, very unadorned chambers. He ate very uh, austere meals. He did everything he could for himself without having servants or all these people do things for him. You know, he, he wanted to be self-sufficient. Um, and so he lived this like amazing life. Now, during his reign, there was a massive pandemic um, that was ravaging the empire. Uh, he had rebellions that had to be put down. Uh, he was fighting wars with the Germanic tribes. So it, w- it was a very eventful uh, reign as an emperor, and he dealt with it very stoically. He did his duty. It's, again, it's not like they're pacifists or this or that. He, he knew he had to fight the enemies of Rome. Uh, he didn't want to, but he did what he had to do. And he ended up being a very well-remembered uh, emperor. And his book, Meditations, wasn't a book. That was his philosophical journal. That's Those were for, literally his meditations. Yeah, that wasn't meant to be published. That was for him. That was mm. him writing down his own thoughts for his own sake. And now we look at those as as something that, that is philosophical that we try to employ in our lives. But really, we should be creating our own meditations. We should be writing down our own philosophical thoughts every night and trying to build up our own character. Do you think that Marcus Aurelius filled, uh, fulfilled Plato's requirement of philosophy and politics blending in one body, that that was responsible for the success of Rome at that time, and that after that influence, you start to see a decline in the empire because the, the light of philosophy has gone out? Absolutely. I think Marcus Aurelius is an example of the philosopher king. To to tie it back to that quote of Plato at the beginning of this podcast, he's an example of what we need in society today. This this is why we're so upset. We don't have philosopher kings. We have people that are pandering to us. We have people uh, that are just telling us what we want to hear, playing political games, just trying to enrich themselves, living these lavish lifestyles, never really seeing what the poor... um, Never seeing poverty, should I say? Mm-hmm. You know, like they, they, they don't, they're not in touch with the realities. They don't have a bird's eye view. Mm-hmm. They have a very detailed view of their own debauchery and hedonism, you know, and, and then they put on this good show for us. They're not philosophers. They don't know anything about philosophy. They, they don't know anything about governing a nation. This ultimately leads us to this pivotal point in Stoicism that there are two types of philosophers, the librarian philosopher and the warrior philosopher. Those that live the virtues of philosophy and those that just collect data to put in the library of their head to show off to their buddies. Well, you know, in my opinion, I, I think we've been kind of overtaken by the librarian philosopher, the, the, the philosophers that just want to collect all these beautiful words and these concepts that worked, you know, in this place at this time, but, and publish all these books and anthologies about what philosophy is. But, you know, and a lot of people, they don't like this language, but the warrior philosophy lives philosophy it doesn't mean you have to be a soldier you don't have to go out and kill people you're not but... wielding a real sword I mean, <laughs> this is an analogy of course like the, the warrior philosophy does battle with himself 
And that's what Freemasonry encourages us to do, to become the warrior philosopher that crushes the evil in our own hearts, not to go out and find some external source for us to put all of our problems on, but to turn inwards, to venture into the interior of the earth, to find the hidden stone, to slay the dragons within ourselves, to take up arms against our own evils and not to project them on other people. And thus Stoicism presents us the perfect model for the Freemason, to live a life free of passion, to overcome all that makes us base, and to make us an example for all mankind so that we become Marcus Aurelius, we become the philosopher king, that we lead the world to the light of philosophy and truth. Thank you for listening to Legends of the Craft. This podcast is purely the opinion of brothers Matthias Comcier and Axel Suvari and does not represent the official views of Universal Comasonry. Universal Comasonry is a Masonic order founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity that admits men and women without distinction of race, religion, or creed. For more information, please visit universalfreemasonry.org.